and he has a very vast 45 experience of teaching both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels and guiding the PhD research programs. He has been extensively also involved in many of the industrial consultancy in the fields of biotechnology. With around 45 years experience, he has specialized on uh, the patents which he developed on biofilters for air pollution control and air pollution control devices for cupola furnace. During his career, he has published three books which are very widely read among the students. He edited three books and is also working on three more number of books which are under print. He has 26 number of journals published in various national and international journals of repute. And uh, by this time, he has undertaken around 60 number of industrial projects which have been related to problem solving relating to the pollution concerns in various industries, especially the air and sewage industry. Uh, prior to joining in uh, Gurukul Vidya Peet, he also was director of a private engineering college and before that he also worked as chairman department of chemical engineering at Punjab University Chandigarh. He also worked dean faculty of engineering and technology at PU Chandigarh. He was founder dean in the University Institute of Engineering and Technology, again the college of Punjab University Chandigarh. Keeping in view his expertise and uh, his association, he was uh, third as a member Senate Upper Institute of Engineering and Technology Patiala. He also served as a member research board GJU Hisar and Vikram University Ujjain and also Kurukshetra University Kurukshetra. He has been working as member tribunal for Chandigarh Pollution Control Committee and was vice president for ESI from year 1977 to 2000. He is also an expert member on NBA committee of AICT for accreditation of engineering courses and member of NAAC PEER team to assess various universities which is an organization which gives a relating to accreditation of universities. He has been subject experts and member of various selection committees of various engineering colleges and engineering universities and is a life member of Society of Technical Education and Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers. This brief introduction, I take the pleasure to invite Dr. S.C. Jain to deliver his talk on chemical hazards. Friends, good morning. Hmm? Friends, good morning. I am here being brought to share my experiences on chemical hazards. Chemicals play a vital role in our life, right from birth till death. It is a part and parcel of a human system, part and parcel of the society and the world as a whole. These occupy an important segment of our economy and are also source of large benefits to the society. In recent years, there has been a rapid increase in the number, variety and complexity of these chemicals used by the industry and in our daily life too. Now, some care has to be taken in handling the chemicals. These chemicals are very toxic flammable, reactive and many times explosives and or a combination of all such characters and these are classified all these substances which has these characteristics as hazardous chemicals. Chemi these chemicals have potential hazards not only to human beings, flora and fauna, all forms of property and our environment as a whole. So extreme care has to be taken and it's very essential in handling such chemicals in any form at all stages of manufacture, processing, treatment, package, storage, transportation, use, collection, destruction, even conversion and sales. 
So you can see how important is the chemical hazards considerations in this care. Several agencies of the Government of India, both at central and state level, such as the Directorate of Explosives, Inspectorate of Factories, Port and Transport Authorities, they are all interested in the responsibility of ensuring safe handling and management of these hazardous chemicals under the Act and Rules framed. In spite of these measures, the possibility of accidents cannot be ruled out. Human errors like mechanical, electrical, instrumental or system failures have on occasions led to grave disasters. Now, what is a disaster? The emergency in works is one which has a potential to cause serious injuries. That is we call as emergency. It may cause extensive damage to property and disruption both inside and outside the works too. Now, irrespective of the cause emergency will normally manifest in three forms. There may be a fire, there may be an explosion, there may be toxic release and it is dependable on type of the industry. If the emergency becomes uncontrollable and leads to extensive damage to life and property in and around the work, then this emergency is called a disaster. Whereas each industry is expected to take steps to assess, minimize and wherever feasible eliminate the risk accidents may still occur in spite of measures taken by the industry. So emergency planning becomes a necessary element of mitigating the effect of emergency. Now something about hazards. What is an hazard? It is defined as a physical or a chemical characteristic that has a potential for causing harm to people or the environment or the property as such. And they are due to the transfer of energy in one form or other. And if the energy transfer is more then with standing capacity of the receiving end, then hazard is created. Now some forms of energy release are there. They are kinetic, potential, electrical, chemical, thermal and acoustics. Kinetics generally get generated when there is a rotating machinery, revolving machinery, vibratory positions are there, reciprocating are there falling objects are there, then this kinetic form of energy is being exchanged. Whereas for potential energy, all stored pressures and coil springs, they are their cause of potential energy. Electricity including the static charge itself is an energy form of electrical, say energy and chemicals which we are trying to discuss today as chemical hazards, they are the characters are can be if it is a flammable, reactive, poisonous, explosives, corrosives and toxics. These characteristics may cause a chemical energy intensive programs. Whereas thermal energy is being belonging to hot surfaces, molten metals, boilers, furnaces and acoustic of course refers to noise and ultrasonic velocity. Now, something about an accident. What is an accident? Accident is an unexpected disaster, you can say a mishap. If there is a disaster, we say an accident has occurred. All accidental injuries and damages result from application of specific form of energy in amount exceeding the resistance of the system upon which they impinge. So if energy releases more than the taking capacity, then there will be an accident. Or when there is an interference in the normal exchange of energy between the human system or organism and the environment. For example, you get suffocation is there by drowning. It can be prevention of energies can often be achieved by controlling the source of energy or the carrier through which the energy reaches the body. This theory paves the way in controlling the hazards. Hazardous chemical is a chemical which is explosive, flammable, poisonous, corrosive, reactive or radioactive. It requires special care in handling because of the hazards it poses to public health and environment. Harmful effects of chemicals are toxicity, flammability, reactivity, corrosion and explosive nature. These are the five characteristics which are harmful in effect cause of hazards. 
something about toxicity. Most of the materials used in the manufacture of chemicals are poisonous to some extent. The potential hazards will depend on the inherent toxicity of the material and frequency and duration of any exposure. Toxicity depends on dose, formulation, route of exposure, duration and the physical form in which they enter. And a substance can cause harmful effect when a person is exposed to it through dermal, means through skin, oral, you say you can take through the throat, or inhalations through nose. Now, this effect of exposure to toxic substances are three types, acute, subchronic, and chronic. Acute occurs when there is a single or multiple exposure in 24 hours or less, one exposure so, or a number of exposure during the 24 hours. The subchronic type is repeated daily exposures for about 10% of the lifespan, total lifespan, 10% exposure is subchronic means simulations. Then the chronic is the repeated daily exposures for about 80% of span. Now, chronic example can be, for example, cyanide fumes. If the person is working, let us say, in a molding shop or case hardening shop, he is exposed to the cyanides. And as such, then most of the lifespan is exposed to that and it becomes a chronic. There may be a tuberculosis, a cancerous, etc. These are the effects of those toxic substances. Then, measurement of inherent toxicity of a material. How we measure this toxicity materials? Inherent toxicity of material is measured by tests, normally tests being conducted in health by on animals. Expressed as a lethal dose, the test animal here is rats. When 50% of the animals get killed, we call it as a toxicity limit and that is LD50. And the dose is expressed in the quantity of milligrams assailed of this toxic substances by kilogram weight of the body, weight of you can say the test animal. The LD50 it measures a acute effect and it applies only to short term effects. So in 24 hours some exposures are there, this uh, toxic exposures they call acute form of pain and that is measured in LD50. Some of the LD50 values on rats which have been reported by the doctors or the biologists working or zoologists working they are on chemicals like, for example, potassium cyanide. It is a lethal, 10 milligrams per kg, even if it is given a small dose, then it is a lethal dose. So, potassium cyanide is toxic substance. Similarly, tetraethyl lead, formerly used in the petrol, it was around 3.5, so it has been removed. Lead, even which is used, say, in the most of your public health, it is 100 milligrams per kg if it is used, it is toxic. DDT a 150, aspirin even 1500 milligrams you take. So, in those of increased dose is there, but aspirin do tox the diet and cause nausea. And even the table salt, well, say more than 3000 milligrams you take, a repulsion is there and this becomes toxic. No doubt we daily take the table salt on our food. Now, toxicity ratings can be dangerous, it can be moderate, it can be low. Now, dangerous cause irreparable loss, irreversible changes, the permanent damage. As I said, a person working in a case hardening unit, a small vendor working on these vulcanizing, they are exposed to cyanides. Continuously 80% of lifespan they are exposed, so they are irreparable losses. He, he will be developing the tuberculosis, cancers and ultimate death, so they are dangerous in character. Moderate reversible changes are there, you take, for example, ammonia tanker get burst on the road, you inhale ammonia. So, there is an osea, there is a vomiting, there is, but reversible cause is there, take plenty of water, etc. Some medical aid, it can be checked. And low, we are readily reversible, simply washing can do. So, these limits have been studied by the biologists and rats, as I mentioned earlier, in the LD50s. So, less than 400, 400, 4000, and more than 4000 are the lethal dose, which I just picturized on this slide. Whereas equivalent to a human body, human body normal weight is around 70 kg and in 70 kg the dangerous effect will be if less, even less than 500 milligrams per kg is being assimilated, it is dangerous in character. Less than 5 grams, earlier was 500 milligrams, now it is 5 grams per kg, they call moderate and 15 grams per kg they will call low. So it is the intensity of the materials which matters which will cause 
dangerous, moderate and low. As I said, cyanide is dangerous. Ammonia is moderate. Acids can be easily washed. They are of low character hazards. Now that was for the low doses. But what happens to the high doses? Here another term has been used, what we say is a threshold limit value. Commonly used as a guide for controlling long-term exposures of the workers to the contaminated air. So this is normally used in industrial practice. So this threshold value defined as a concentration to which it is believed the average worker could be exposed daily, day by day, for eight hours a day, five days a week, without suffering harm. So it is the safe limit up to which any exposure is there daily, in eight hours working, five days a week, he can sustain. That is threshold limit value. It is also expressed in a milligram per kg or ppms for the vapors and gases and milligrams per meter cube for dust. And recommended TLV values are published in the bulletins in various journals and is given by the earliest in the United by the United States Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Now, prerequisites for handling the toxic are that you must have the knowledge of the material, means all its properties, characters, etc. And also there should be a listing of the materials, safety data, which includes chemical and physical properties, its disposal, first aid practice, safety appliances needed, toxicological data, these two values are given. For example, if you inhale chlorine sometimes, so there will be given how much ppm chlorine is permissible and if those is there, what antidote you have to take how much washing you have to take, what safety precautions you have to take. Even if there is dust, you have to take a precaution. Precaution like, for example, your clothes say have a cover on your mouth, nose, etc. So that we, mm, dust inhaled will be less. Now, regarding the, so that was toxicity, the major. The second is the flammability. It is the capacity, you can say, a susceptibility to get ignited. It is the inherence of the chemistry part. It is a chemical formula of a material and is termed flammability. How much flammable it is? It is known that usually vapors and gases, they formed on heating and mixed with air. Yeah. And when they are mixed with air, they get ignited. For example, petrol. Petrol vapors are there. With air they mix, they get ignited. So petrol is flammable. Similarly, kerosene and so on. The hazards caused by flammable materials depend on a number of factors. Now what are those factors on which this? First is the flash point of the material. I'll explain a bit. Then auto ignition temperature of material, flammability limits and energy released in combustion. Flash point is, uh, is the most important here. It, this is of a liquid. It is the lowest temperature at which it gives off enough vapor to form an Ignitable mixture with air. Means a liquid is there, some vapors are there. At the temperature where the vapors are just ignitable, if they get ignited, that is what we say is a flash point. At flash point, the vapor will burn, but only briefly. Inadequate vapor is produced to maintain combustion. So small vapors are there, they are inadequate. Completion is not there, but they are flammable. And flash point generally increases with increasing pressure. <coughs> so, auto ignition temperature, as the word auto shows, this is of a substance temperature at which it ignites spontaneously in air without any external source of ignition. Just say, for example, camphor catch fires immediately. It is an indication of maximum temperature to which a material can be heated in air. Most of the drying operations in industry, they are susceptible to auto-ignition temperature. About the limits of a material, they are the lowest and the highest concentrations at normal pressure and temperature at which the flame will propagate through the mixture. So they show a range of concentrations over which the material will burn in air if ignited. Now, this is a just a pictorial diagram which gives the concentrations with temperature and which gives you a say flash point, auto point, where auto is there, which is flammable or not flammable, pictorial representation. And it is the graphic representation or say tabular representation where we say the lower limits 
some of the common substances are listed. There are more than 1,200 such materials listed by the Occupational Health of United States Agency. Some of the common here in India at present is ammonia. Ammonia tankers are shown there. Methane. Methane is a commercial gas. Cyclohexane being used as solvent. Acetone frequently used as solvent. Petrol and kerosene in say our transport. And their lower and upper limits are being just mentioned and has been taken from those tablets. You can see here ammonia has a range 15 to 28 narrow range. Whereas in petrol 1 to 7 high range. So it can ignite over a large range, it can cause more of explosions, whereas ammonia will not cause that much explosions, percentage increase. Similarly, acetone, it can cause, say, you must have heard in the papers, many times in industry, the storage tank got burnt, there is a flammable character, fire is there, damage is there. It is due to this storage of the solvents like acetone and cyclohexane, which is a range, you can say, from 1.3 to 8 or 3 to 12. So this is a clear indication that these limits are essential for selections and handling. Even the dust becomes flammable. If it is a finer dust below 100 micron diameter, because those they settle very slowly and if, if they are flammable and they have the air dust mixture, combustion is there. Very high energy is involved. Explosions are there. Even in floor mill you can expect a fire and explosion. So metal powders, plastics, agricultural products, they are all a few examples which can cause dust exposure. Very common also this is in the industry. The third major character of the hazardous chemicals is that of reactivity. Certain substances are considered fairly innocuous when handled or stored alone. However, when blended with certain other substances, these can cause vigorous reactions with harmful effects. Acid and alkalis, you all know, they have a hazardous effect because of their reactions. Sulfuric acid in water creates a lot of heat and it is corrosive, so it is a reactive. Oxidizing agents and reducers and metals with acids, they are all chronic examples of reactivity. Corrosion is another property. Corrosion is defined as destruction material due to the effect of exposure to the environment. It is a reactivity, of course, but with the environment now. Environmental things, say, constituents, they, uh, say, attack the metals, so the corrosion occurs. It is a common cause of hazards due to the wrong material of construction and due to change in process conditions. Last is the explosive nature of the material. An explosive is sudden, catastrophic, release of energy causing a pressure wave. When it burns, a pressure wave is there. An explosion can occur without fire, such as failure through overpressure of a steam boiler or an air receiver. Explosive is a substance or a mixture of substances which on getting proper stability undergoes a significantly fast self-propagating reaction characterized by forming more stable products. So explosion can be mechanical in character, bursting of a steam boiler is an example. And other can be a chemical reaction, for example, a fire in petrol. Fire and explosions have been a common cause of the accidents in handling, transportation, as well as in storage, in the industry. They represent a substantial hazard in the form of fires. Combustion of one, is, I can give you a simple example I have taken. Say a small amount, a gallon of tall bean can destroy an ordinary chemistry lab, simple chemistry lab in minutes and person may get. So a small amount of tall bean if I keep in a lab and it gets fired or explodes, then even the death can be there even of attendant in that lab and lot of disasters can be there. So this is so dangerous in such a, the potential Consequences of fire and explosions in pilot plants and plant environments are even greater. So they are on a prototype. And three most common plant accidents are fires, explosions and toxic releases. Now organic solvents, organic I hope you know, it is from the nature. It is, does not contain mineral. It is a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur compounds. So organic solvents are most common source of fire and explosion in chemical industry. 
To prevent accidents resulting from fires and explosions, engineers must be familiar with fire and explosion property of the material, nature of the fire and explosion process, and procedure to reduce fire and explosion hazards. So they should know the properties, they should know the nature, and then the procedure to prevent them. Now here, I just taken an example of a small fire. What is fire? I tried to explain here through a concept of fire triangle. Essential elements of combustion are some fuel should be there, an oxidizer should be there, ignition source should be there, and these elements can be illustrated by a simple triangle. You can see here, this red one, fire. It needs air an oxidant, a fuel, and an ignition source. If three are there, then only fire will be there. You can see if fuel is there, ignition is there, but there is no air, there will not be any fire. So any two sides will not cause fire. All the three sides have to be there, then only there will be a fire. So fire burning is the rapid exothermic oxidation of ignited fuel. So for example, in coal burns or a petrol burns, it is an oxidation process, exothermic process, heat is produced and so on. So it can be, fuel can be a solid, liquid or vapor form, but vapor and liquid fuels are generally easier to ignite. Solid is difficult. Coal is slightly difficult to ignite compared to petrol, kerosene and so on, or a methane gas or ONGC. The combustion always occurs in vapor phase. Liquids are vaporized, volatilized and the solids are decomposed into vapor before combustion. So this is a condition for fire. When fuel oxidizer and ignition source are present in necessary amount, burning will occur. I said necessary amount. Means fuel is not present and is not present in sufficient quantity. Then there will not be any fire. Oxidizer, for example air, is not present or is not present in sufficient quantity then only the fire will not be there. The ignited source is not energetic enough to ignite. So the flame is not, I'll say, energetic to cause the fire. I'll explain this a bit later too. Now, common fuels which are there on our globe, on global market, they are liquids like gasolines. It can be aviation, it can be transport petrol, it can be domestic kerosene and so on. Then acetone, Cyclohexane, a common solvent used in the industry. Then ether is another and pentane is another. In that direction, they are being used in the industry and they have a potential to cause explosion and fire and catch fire. Solids like plastics, wood, dust, fibers, even small metal particles as I explained earlier, they can be a cause. And even the gas, that is the acetylene, propane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, etc. They are all common fuels. Common oxidizers can be also gases, for example, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine. They are all oxidizers. Liquid, hydrogen peroxide, nitric oxide, perchloric. They are the typical examples which can cause fire. And solids like ammonium nitrate or metal peroxides. Common ignition source can be a spark, it can be a flame, it can be heat, or it can be a static electricity. In fact, static electricity has been very frequently has been diagnosed as cause of major industrial hazards. Now, what is the difference between a fire and an explosion? The major distinction is the rate of energy release. Fire release energy slowly, whereas explosion release energy rapidly. It is on a microsecond levels. In a spur, if energy release is fast, it is explosion. If energy release is slow, then it is a fire. Fire can also result from explosion. Some explosion somewhere is there, nearby, some vapors are there, they will catch fire. Or explosion can also result from fire. There is a fire. There is a bursting of the vessel and an explosion may occur. Mm -hmm. 
Now, examples for energy release rate effects. What are the examples? How this energy release is there? A good example of how energy release rate affect the consequences of an accident. I can cite an example of automobile tire. The compressed air within the tire contains energy. If the energy is released slowly through the nozzles and the tire is deflated harmlessly, so there is no harm. Energy release is slow through that nozzle. But if the tire ruptures suddenly and all the energy within compressed tire releases rapidly, there will be a dangerous explosion. So this I have taken because you can understand bursting of a tire when you are moving in a car. So slowly you can release the energy through nozzles, but if there is a puncture, there will be a sudden release and there will be an explosion. So an explosion is a rapid expansion of gases resulting in a rapidly moving pressure or a shock wave. The explosion can be mechanical, as I said, by means of sudden rupture of a pressurized vessel or it can be a result of a rapid chemical reaction. Explosion damage is caused by the pressure or the shock wave which gets result from that. Some parameters significantly affecting the behavior of the explosions are the ambient temperature. Say for example, explosion will be small or less harmful at a higher altitude in hills. Temperature is around cold or in winter, temperature is low, so small chances are there. In summer, it is more, so ambient temperature, ambient pressure, high altitude or low altitude or plains. Composition of explosive materials, what is the composition of that material, physical properties of that, even the nature of the ignition source, I said energy and its generation, what is the type, what is the energy, how much duration it is being given. Then the geometry, is it in a closed content or it is unconfined? And amount of combustible material, how much amount of that material is available? And then the turbulence of that time before ignition, rate at which the combustible material is released. These are some parameters which affect the behavior of the explosion. Now different types of explosions have been reported. Mechanical character. I just tire example, deflagration, detonation, confined explosion, unconfined explosion, boiling liquid expanding, vapor explosions, dust explosions and over pressure. I just briefly explain each by definition only. The mechanical explosion is an explosion resulting from the sudden failure of a vessel containing high pressure non-reactive gas. So this is non-reactive, there is no chemical reaction in it. Deflagration is an explosion in which reaction front that, is, that shock wave moves at a speed less than the speed of the sound in an unreacted medium. Again, there is no reaction, but the movement of the wave is at a speed less than that of the sound. And the detonation when this speed is greater than the sound. That is the only difference. And the confined means an explosion occurring within a vessel or a building, where the unconfined is an explosion occurring in open. Some emphasis again we have to make on what is the difference between detonation and deflagration. The damage effect from an explosion depend highly on whether the explosion results from detonation or deflagration. The difference depends on whether the reaction front propagates above or below the speed of the sound in unreacted gases. For ideal gases, the speed of sound or sonic velocity, what we say, is a function of temperature and has a value of 344 meters per second at 20 degrees Celsius. So that is the base. So less than that, I don't know that will cause detonation or deflagrations. Fundamentally, the sonic velocity is a speed at which the information is transmitted through the gas. <coughs> In boiling liquid expanding vapor compression occurs if a vessel that contains a liquid at a temperature above its atmospheric pressure boiling point and dust. So above the boiling point, this some exposure is there. The subsequent this VLEV, what we call boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion, is the explosive vaporization of a large fraction of vessel contents, possibly 
followed by combustion or explosion of the vaporized cloud if it is combustible. This type of the explosion occurs when an external fire heats the content of the tank of the volatile material. ITM Bhirwada, please open your mic off. No, no, no. Okay, let's go. As the tank content heat, the vapor pressure of the liquid within the tank increases. The tank structural integrity is reduced because of the heating and the tank ruptures the hot liquid pulletized express. Friends, in our vicinity, in one of the Renbeck Sea, I cite an example here, there was a storage vessel for cyclonic sea. Lot of heat cuts generated from the nearby heat exchanger heated that vessel. There was some design, say fault might be there, but suddenly that vessel exploded. Why? There was a rupture, solvent came out, get vaporized, cloud formed, and some electricity source was there, charge source was there, and there was a huge, say, explosion, the tank ruptured, and lot of casualty took place. So this is a very dangerous, you can say, exposures in the industry in chemical manufacturing especially through solvents. Now how to judge? Do fire and explosion index. Do chemical industry way back in 1987 developed a concept of an index what we say fire and explosive index. This is used for any operation in which flammable combustible or reactive material is stored, handled or processed. This fire and explosive index is calculated in numerical calculation based on the nature of process and the properties of the process material. The larger the value, the more dangerous the process is. So these are the rough categorizations of fire and explosive indexes. So it can be light, it can be moderate, it can be intermediate, it can be heavy, it can be severe. These are the numericals, they are available in any export. Now what are the steps involved in calculation? I said it is a mathematical, a numerical calculation, a simple calculation. These are the steps involved. You have to select a pertinent process unit, explain, then determine the material factor, determine special material hazard, determine general process hazard, determine special process hazards, determination of hazard factors, and finally the determination of fire and explosive index. I will cite with an example later. First, what are the steps? A pertinent process unit is one which can have an impact on storage from a loss prevention point, standpoint. Of. What is this unit? It can be a storage unit, it can be a reactor unit, it can be a pump. Say so anything in that. So, one unit you have to take. It is not a full industrial unit. We are taking individual component of the unit. The important factor for selecting pertinent process units, say chemical energy potential, quantity of hazardous material in the process unit, and operating pressure and temperature in that vessel. Material factor. It is a measure of intrinsic rate of potential energy release from fire or explosion produced by the combustion or other chemical reactions. National Fire Production Association has assigned some values to MF for different substances. If the material has already been assigned this MF value by this organization, we take straight from the literature. But if it is not available, then it can be calculated considering flash point and boiling point which are available in literature. Or for commercial material in general, for example, your natural gas, your kitchen gas and so on, this can be calculated from this equation, where material factor is the heat of combustion into this factor, the empirical factor which has been reported by literature and holds for almost all combustible materials with a plus minus 5 percent error.
special material hazards determination. These factors are included to take into account any special hazards associated with material present. This material factor has to be increased by a percentage for each hazards. This special material hazards has to be material factor which is calculated into percent factor suggested for SMI. Now SMI are given for a different substances, for different say setups. Say there may be polymerization, there may be storage, there may be see all these factors are there. I just listed three or four. It can there are 22 such factors reported in literature, and this is just a notion given that this value you take, material factor you are taken, simply multiply it. In example, I will explain later a bit. Similarly, determination of general process hazards, GPH. Now, GPH is a measure of relative magnitude of probable incident which can occur due to hazards organizing from special installations. We have already calculated special material hazard. It has to be now multiplied by a factor for general process hazards. Now, general processor. Now, that was first was for materials. It is reactive, explosive, and so on. Now, it is for operational type. For example, there can be handling. There can be a physical change. Combinations, batch reactions, continuous reactions, multiplicity. Means this is an operational technique. Are you simply handling? For example, transport of ammonia, it is a handling process. Burning of kerosene gas, or oh sorry, natural gas in your kitchen, it is a handling process. So certain factors are suggested. Again, they are symbolic. There are many in the literature as such, you have to multiply. Here emphasis is on how to calculate. Now, what are the attributes to this general process hazards? For example, exothermic chemical reactions. If there is an exothermic chemical reaction you foresee in your that process, then a penalty is to be given. It means multiplication has to be done, additional. It is 0 0.3 for a mild exothermic reactions like hydrogenation to 1.25 for sensitive exothermic reaction like nitration. So type of reaction you can see, one is hydrogenation and nitration, how extent this heat get evolved, in hydrogen less, in nitration more, so you have to give an additional penalty for that process. Endothermic process, the penalty 0.2 is applied to reactors only and increased to 0.4 if the reactor is heated by combustion of a fuel. So there is a heating in that reactor, then 0.4, otherwise 0.2. Material handling and transfer only a penalty of 0.5. Enclosed or indoor process, it accounts for additional hazards where ventilation is restricted. There is no ventilation. Zero, some there, 0.3, varies. Assess of emergency equipments, area not having adequate assess are penalized. Minimum requirement is there should be assess from two sides. If there is none, then a penalty is to be given 0.5. Drainage and spill control, penalties for drainage conditions where no spills are favorable, additional penalty of 0.5 is to be given. Then special process hazard, lastly it is a pro, say measure of relative probability of an incident which can occur due to hazards inherent in process. Now again the GPH has to be derived by this factor. Now, it has a process, for example, it can be low pressure, it can be temperature consideration, it can be high temperature, low temperature operations and so on. These are a number of such factors, they are again symbolic is there. But what are the factors which contribute to this? They are then given here, you can say if it is a toxic material, sub-atmospheric measures, then flammable cases, these are all penalties, these are the factors which have to be taken into account. Explosions, relief measures, low temperatures, 
quality of uh, quantity of flammable materials, corrosions, leakage, joints, etc. <coughs> so these are the factors which have to be taken. You can see whatever that factor is. Again, I will explain it with the example here. Now you see the calculation. I have taken a very simple say calculation example uh, example that is your kitchen gas a cylinder is there LPG handling and storage two angles are taken why I have chosen this one is you are handling this LPG gas in your kitchen so how to find out F and I index and another is this LPG gas is being bottled taken on the tankers to the bottling plant or after bottling they are transported in a truck to your site so handling and storage is important for LPG gas. <coughs> now material factor. There is not, nothing is given. So first is the composition of the LPG gas. It is propane, butane and isobutane. It is a mixture of three components. It is specific values are given, percentages are given 38.3, 37.1, 24.2. Its molecular weights we know and heat of combustion, they are all given in handbook in literature. So this heat of combustion is being calculated. It will be the fraction of propane, let us say, into the heat of combustion. 38.3% is the propane, so 0.383 into the heat of combustion for propane, which is 830.605. Similarly for others, make the addition of the three it becomes six is five kilocalories per mole and we have to express in kilojoules per kilomoles i hope calculations is very simple and clear similarly calculate the molecular weight additive between again the fraction of propane into the molecular weight of propane plus fraction of butane into molecular weight of butane normal butane plus Fraction of isobutane into molecular weight of butane. So calculations have been done. 52.582 is the molecular weight. Again, a simple calculation. Substitute in that equation, and you find material factor. So it is a very simple calculation. Can be done by any person. Now, next is special material hazard has to be calculated. So this chart is available to us, oxidizing materials, reactions, subject to say spontaneous heating and so on. Factors suggested are there as I mentioned last in the last slides. So here you have to select. Now you can see for LPG, there is no oxidizing, so zero factor. Similarly, it doesn't react with water, so zero factor. They all are there. There is no detonation, zero. There is no decomposition, zero. No polymerization, zero. So total is zero. So it will be 100 plus this total divided by 100 into mf. So 100 plus zero over 100 into 22.75. So this becomes special material hazard. Then calculate general process hazard for it. Again a chart, only handling and physical change, yes there is handling, so you have to use the factor 50%, there is no reaction, there is no batch reaction, there is no multiplicity, so zeros, so total GPH is 50, so you have 100 plus 50 over 100 into SMH, so calculation is there 34.125. Again, a simple calculation you can do. Then special hazards calculations. Low pressure below 1 to 100. There is, no, there is no factor involved. Below it is not below 1 atmosphere. Operations near the explosive range. There are. When you fire, there can be an explosion. So somewhere in between. It can be 100, 110, 90, but as I said, so around 100. Low temperature, if it is a carbon steel, 10 to 30. Yes, it is a carbon steel vessel, so 15. And temperature is not below minus 30, so it is 0. 
high temperature above flash point above boiling point yes above auto ignition no so this way you are like so high pressure 15 to 200 bar yes but above 200 bar it is not similar you continue pressure reaction difficult to control there is no dust there is none storage there is none large quantities no what is the range range normally about 25 meter cube is there so you have taken the value 45 rest is not there is nothing so you add them all and again find so you have this factor 100 plus this factor over 100 into gph so this becomes your fire and explosive index which is 104 so it is intermediate degree of hazards death cannot occur if there is no fire but there can be serious injuries too when a cylinder blow so this example say i have taken to explain you how we can calculate simple calculation now common ignition sources in chemical industry they are sparks and they result from static charge build up or sudden discharge static electricity perhaps the most elusive of ignition source this fight considerable efforts serious explosions and fires caused by static ignition continue to plague the chemical process industry now i'll cite some of the case histories here first a bit of static electricity what is static charge it is build up it is a result of physically separating a poor conductor from a good conductor or another poor conductor when different materials touch each other the electrons move across the interface from one surface to other upon separation more electrons remain on one surface than on the other so material become positively charged and other negatively charged so that cause electricity so now i give you some of the case histories first for explosions then for reactivity a large portion of reported fire and explosions are the result of flammable say mixtures being ignited by a spark caused by static electricity some major accidents have also been attributed to chemical reactivity so first i take the first one that of explosions let us say simple case of car loading means a tanker is to be loaded let us say with petrol or a kerosene or some solvent so two plant operators were filling this tank with vinyl acetate as the solvent one operator was on the ground floor the other on the top of the tank car with a nozzle with putting this is and of that nozzle into the tank a few second after loading operation started the contents of the tank exploded the moment they start up the filling a tank explosion occurred the operator on the top of the tank was thrown to the ground he sustained the fracture skull multiple body injury and then died from these injuries this is an actual accident which is occurred now this is the tank we are filling so accident investigation indicated that the explosion was caused by static electricity spark that jumped from the steel nozzle to the tank car nozzle was not bonded to the tank car to prevent static accumulation use of non metallic hose pipe probably also contributed so charge transfer was not there so there is an explosion let us say an explosion in a centrifuge normally used centrifuges are in the industry so a slurry containing solvent mixture of 90% methyl cyclohexane and 10% toluene were being fed to a basket centrifuge type of the centrifuge basket a foreman was about to look into the centrifuge when it exploded he just saw that everything is right it sudden explosion is there the lid was lifted and a flame was released between the centrifuge and the lid the foreman hand was burned this is the example so 
this on the right side, there is a centrifuge. The lid drops off when there is a spark. So material from this come and there is an explosion outside. So the fill line from the reactor to the centrifuge was Teflon line seal running to a point. There is a sensor. The short line from the sleeve to the centrifuge was of steel. The centrifuge was lined. Accident investigation indicated that the flammable atmosphere had developed because of an air leakage. There was an air leakage in that. The line centrifuge was the source of ignition as a result of static accumulation and discharge. Another example we can take that of dust system explosion. Two dust systems in the same vicinity contain dust transport lines, dryers and hoppers. One system was recently repaired and left open and the open system emitted some methanol vapors. The other system was being charged through a funnel with a dry organic intermediate. The charge line consisted of a few glass pipes and a 2 meter section of plastic pipe. The duct system that was being charged exploded violently and explosion initiated other fires. Now what was the cause of this dust explosion system? The Accident investigation indicated that methanol vapors entered the second charging system. The transportation of the intermediate dust through the glass and pipeline generated a static electricity charge and a spark. And the ignition source created violent explosion in both systems. Several explosions went were rough and a building blow out of panel was also. So one rupture, the other rupture and the whole building was just exploded. Still we can have another example that of explosion in a solid storage bin. Storage like wheat storage, grain storage, plastic storage. So a dry organic powder was collected in a hopper. A piece of tramp metal entered the hopper with a solid, some metal piece, small metal piece, somehow entered. As it rolled down the solids, it accommodated the charge by charging the method called separation. At some point in the operation, the tramp metal, that small metal piece, approached the metal wall of the hopper, which was grounded. A spark jumped from this tramp metal to the grounded wall. The spark was energetic compared to minimum ignition energy of the dust. So it, its charge is more than that of the taking capacity. So because the storage hopper atmosphere was air, which contains even the dust, the dust exploded and the storage hopper captured. So a small piece of material going in that organic has caused this explosion. Now, so this was about explosion cases. Something about the chemical reactivity. Although accidents attributable to chemical reactivity are less frequent, Compared to the fires and explosions, the consequences are dramatic, destructive, and often injurious to the people. When working with chemicals, the potential for unwanted, unexpected, and hazardous reactions must always be recognized. Here we can recall Bhopal tragedy as a case history in this direction. Now, Bhopal tragedy, it is an accident in Union Carbide plant at Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh on December 3, 1984. This plant produced pesticides. An intermediate compound to this process is methyl isocyanate, MIC. It is an extremely dangerous compound, very reactive, toxic, volatile, and flammable. Maximum exposure concentration for this for workers over the eight hours is 0.0. Individuals exposed to the concentration of MIC above this experience severe irritation in nose and throat. Now, death at large concentration of vapor is due to respiratory distress. This MIC demonstrates a number of dangerous physical properties too. Its boiling point at atmospheric condition is 39.1 degrees Celsius. 
and it has a vapor pressure of 348 millimeters of mercury at 20 degree heat. The vapor is about twice as heavy as air, ensuring that the vapor will stay close to the ground once released. MIC reacts exothermally with water. Lot of heat gets generated when it comes in contact with water. Although the reaction is slow, with inadequate cooling, the temperature will increase and MIC will boil. The MIC storage tanks are typically refrigerated to prevent this problem. So what happened? A storage tank containing large amount of MIC became contaminated with water. A chemical reaction heated MIC to a temperature past its boiling point. The vapor traveled through a pressure relief system and into a scrubber. And the flare system is installed to consume this MIC in the event of release. But unfortunately on that day, the scrubber and flare system were not operating for a variety of reasons. So an estimated 25 tons of toxic MIC vapors were released. The toxic cloud spread to the adjacent town, killing over 2,000 civilians and injuring an estimated 20,000 more. So how catastrophic this incident was. Friends, something about the risk. It has been recognized for some years that industrial activities involving certain hazardous chemicals have the potential to cause serious injuries, death, damage beyond the immediate vicinity of the workplace. Chemicals both natural and synthesized are at the heart of the rapidly say, industrializing and technologically advancing society. <coughs> Although most chemicals present little or no danger to the environment or human health when handled properly with care, even commonly used chemicals because of indiscriminate and negligent handling are over the past few decades proving alarmingly harmful. A need therefore for poor, for proper assessment of the risk posed by them and of continuous care during their manufacture, processing, treatment, package, storage, transport, use and sale are more actually felt now than before in all the countries. It is in this context that a national register for potentially toxic chemicals had been considered. This NRPTC provides national level chemical data collection, management and dissemination of information having a national relevance for our country. Industrial activities involving hazardous chemicals have the potential to cause serious accident which may lead to damage, injury and even death in immediate vicinity of the site. Recognizing the need to control and minimize the risk posed by such activities, the Ministry of Environment and Forest had notified the manufacture, storage and import of hazardous chemical rules in November 1989 under Environment Protection Act 1986. Now, nature of emergencies. In handling hazardous chemicals, an accident leading to an emergency may be any one of the following events. Release of flammable liquids, boiling, non-boiling, or gases resulting in fire, explosion, or gas cloud, thermal radiation, and smoke. Release of flammable, non-flammable, toxic gases, which may be due to leaks, ruptures, etc. Massive release can occur due to storage failure of chemicals, pesticides, accidents, etc. Large spillage on ground or into water resulting in pollution, contamination of air, water, etc. These are the nature of the emergencies. Then structural and boiling, structural and building collapse due to the explosion or heat generated by release of chemicals 
leading to consequential problems. Fire, toxic release from a neighboring factory, storage site or unit, transport vehicle or container affecting living beings and property. Release of high velocity fragments of ruptured vessels due to excessive pressure, overheating and thermal runaway conditions causing direct physical injuries. Overturning of rail, road tankers containing flammable toxic substances and contamination of articles of food and beverages by tox toxic chemicals or other poisonous substances. So now I'll just summarize the things here. The chemical accidents like any other accident occur all of a sudden leaving no room for graduated response. A chemical accident may occur accompanied by or falling from any one of the combinations of the following fire, explosion, release or expose, expose, escape of the toxic gases, spillage of the hazardous substances in storage, processing, transportation or any other type of weapon, say handling. These are the common causes for accidents which have been observed in industry, equipment failure, design deficiency, unsafe act caused by the human error, corrosions, abnormalities in operation or maintenance, fire emergency in neighborhood. So these are some of the natural other causes. There can be storm, there can be earthquake, lightning, air raid, war attack, terrorism, sabotage, etc. Oh, consequences of these accidents, these may be confined within the premises or misspill of the site. Either of these may trigger a cascading effect as well. The direct consequences of an accident are explosions, both confined and unconfined, deflagration, fire and toxicity resulting in indirect effects like damage to building, blast waves, burning, fast moving flames, instantaneous deaths, jarrings, etc. So when hazard is there, hazard analysis becomes an important aspect. So it is a critical component in planning for emergencies. To analyze the safety of a major installation as well as its potential hazards, a hazard analysis should be carried out covering the following areas. So friends, which, which toxic, reactive, explosive or flammable substance in the installation constitutes a major hazard? This has to be answered first. Second, which failure or error could cause abnormal conditions leading to major accidents? Third, the consequences of major accident for the workers, people living, working outside the installation and the environment. Then what are the preventive measures for the accident? And lastly, mitigation of the consequences of an accident. So this information developed on hazard analysis provides both the factual basis to set the priorities for planning and also necessary documentation for supporting planning and response efforts. Three basic components of hazard analysis are hazard identification, vulnerability analysis and risk analysis. These three steps should be followed sequentially even though the level I would say Detail will vary from site to site. That's the end. So, thank you. Any question? <coughs> Any questions, please? You uh, find a better place to place uh, these reactive substances in a building. Should we place it somewhere uh, in the top or somewhere in the down? Uh, what, what do you recommend for the placement of these substances? You see,
placement of substances for first which substance you are talking? We talked about inflammable and reactive substances. Inflammable reactive. Inflammable reactive substances if you want to store in a house or in a factory. Where you want to store? In your house or in a factory? This flammable substance which you are keeping in your house or in a factory? Uh, in a factory, it will depend upon the quantity. Most of the storages, they should be on the ground floor. Acids and alkali should be underground. Most of the storage should be underground. Like for example, in your petrol station. Is it clear? So planning has to be that these flammable hazardous chemicals as far as possible should be undercut. Any questions from KTC Jodhpur? So thank you everybody and uh, thank you Dr. Jain for providing such a lot of information about chemical hazards and giving us in-depth understanding that what are the causes, uh, which are the chemicals which can lead to that. So important issue probably is that uh, I've seen that particularly in small scale units, uh, the labor or the people which are working, they are not given proper information and training about handling the chemicals. And uh, they are generally, you know, uh, given the indication that these may be dangerous. But sometimes, you know, small lapses, which are not really lapses, even like electric spark or small, even the current coming into the contact and cause the crash. So there is probably need that uh, for each even smaller units, uh, they need to be proper information and training given to the people who are working around that, which could probably save uh, this kind of existence taking place. So thanks uh, once again, Dr. Chen, and uh, for the participants, we hope to see around 2.30 back. Thank you.